Okay. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us for the APA live stream here tonight. We're going to talk about some heritage poultry breeding with guests Aaron Angulo um, from California. Aaron breeds Delawares, and we're going to have Matt Hemmer from Kansas, and he's a Ermanet and Barbarell breeder. Right, Matt? Yes, plus Wall Summers. Oh, and plus Wall Summers. I always forget one. Um, we're going to bring Matt into the conversation here as we <laughs> as we uh, get to this the open Q and A session in the, the second uh, two thirds of the of the uh, live stream here, and, the, and we'll start out here walking through some. It's kind of a, a planned interview with there and and talk about you know what what we should be considering for for uh, heritage poultry and um, some advantages and what, what we're looking for and, and things like that. And just kind of have a good conversation and we'll be looking for your questions uh, as we go. We, I will, you, you can ask your questions whenever the, the urge strikes you, but know that I'm going to save most of them for uh, the open Q and a session. So we're going to, we're going to do our program first, 15, 20 minutes, then we'll do the open Q and a, and uh, we'll go from there. So, um, and with with that, let me go ahead and um, get us started. Um, so, welcome, Aaron. Welcome to the show. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, Aaron, I want to be here. <laughs> <laughs> so, we're gonna we're gonna do a couple introductory questions here, and the first thing I want to know from you. Um, the first two, but we're going to, we're going to start by kind of, uh, tell us, tell us what, where you come from, like in regards to the heritage poultry breeders, um, association that you were with before, before you guys came over to APA. Um, so if you could give us like a, a just a quick history there, like About, a one minute version. Yeah. A minute. Okay. Well, in 2000, <laughs> 13, we went to a um, heritage expo held by uh, Baker Creek Seed Company in Santa Rosa, California. And Jim Atkins was doing a talk about uh, heritage chickens. And so we went and watched it and ended up joining SPN, Sustainable Poultry Network, and uh, started with 100 Delawares. And we've been raising Delawares for the last seven years. Um, we were very involved with SPN, and eventually Jim Atkins was looking at going to a 501c3, and he asked um, a large group of us to get together and figure out where we could go from here. And out of that came um, four of us, Matt Hammer, myself, Jeff Maddox, and Karen Johnston, and we decided to do Heritage Poultry Breeders Educational Foundation, and we spent about a year figuring out what, what we were gonna do with it, what our goals were, what our mission statement. Um, the plan behind that was that we wanted to be able to reach out for a very inexpensive cost to help anybody who was interested in raising heritage breeds. Um, it was built on being an educational foundation. So we did a website with a forum where people could ask any types of questions about their different breeds on feed incubating, hatching, um, selecting, very specific. And so that was the whole point was that we wanted to be able to reach out to the hopefully hundreds, maybe a thousand people that are out there and didn't know where to, who to turn to for um, help on raising heritage breeds. Yeah, great. And, uh, and, and so just to bring us up into the, the current uh, Time frame then. So, heritage breeders, heritage poultry breeders was was kind of had a mission to, to educate and train on on breeding, and um, so but I got wind that mm -hmm. the group was kind of looking for um, a, a place to call home, and and so I proposed the idea that you know we should we should investigate that with with APA with the American Pasture Poultry Producers Association with a very mm -hmm. uh, clear understanding and, and kind of vision that I think as we go forward with pasture poultry, we really need to be diversified in our offerings and, and breeding 
is not something that's well represented. We're well represented in the growing of all the birds. We're well represented in the in marketing and processing and those kind of things. But the that that kind of grassroots level of of breeding isn't. And so that's really what we're kicking off here is mm-hmm. is that focus on breeding. We're gonna do some content if you're if you're mm-hmm. seen the app announcements. Um, you know that's we're we're gonna we're just gonna go for it. Uh, provide some training. We're gonna. Tr- try a format here, the live stream. And uh, it's going to be a members only live stream at, at least not at the onset until we see a reason to not do it that way. Um, and we'll, we'll go from there and we'll, and we'll, and we'll build that out. Cause I think this is a very, it's a very important piece of the future and not necessarily saying that it's all of the future. It's even a majority of the future, but it's a piece <clears throat> of that future, the, the foundation. So um, I did, I just saw Patricia Foreman, I feel so lucky tonight. Hi, Pat. Thank you for joining us. Um, I haven't <laughs> talked to Pat in a while. So, <laughs> um, I take our class. <laughs> yeah, um, and and so just a just a, a thing about tone before we jump in here. You know, heritage poultry and and just the idea of uh, of heritage breeds versus the hybrids versus whatever you want to call them is some kinds of polarizing proposition that's not what we're about here so um when you're dealing with po- pa- or, uh, yeah when you're dealing with the heritage breeds inside of appa you know we're going to expect that the, <laughs> that the hybrids and the heritage coexist and that the the breeders and the growers form coalitions mm-hmm. and and build relationships and that's what what's going to take us into the future mm-hmm. so this um my bird is better than your bird we can we can have that conversation and, and point out the advantages but the, the downright um, <laughs> craziness that will come from that, the polarization, the uh, the the vitriol, we, we won't have any of that. So that's kind of the ground rule as we go forth. I'm looking forward to this. You know, I'm a I'm a not a very good breeder myself. I like the idea, but um, so I'm just going to facilitate. We're going to bring in people who can who can drive our conversation forward, and um, yeah. So let's go ahead and, and get started. And, and um, I'm. So the, the format here, um, I asked I asked Aaron to present a, a presentation. He's like, "Well, I don't really do powerpoints um, or anything like that." And I'm like, "Okay, so <laughs> let's do let's do an interview." So we're gonna we're gonna do an interview style okay. here to introduce some okay. some baseline um, questions. And and, bef- and actually, I should probably address one thing. This night was supposed to be this first webinar was supposed to be Douglas Hayes. He had a, a topic lined up that he pitched me that was really, really good. The seven profit centers of, of heritage poultry. Uh, Douglas is, is ill. He wasn't quite feeling up to uh, the, the hour talking and, and pre- preparation. So gave him a pass. Aaron stepped in and, and is going to take the lead in the, the, the uh, presentation portion. And then we'll do the Q&A. Um, so hopefully that all makes sense. And, we're, and we just know that we're, we're pretty well willing to throw it all out and uh, and uh, do something live as it happens. <laughs> so um, we're, we're flexible around here is what I, what I should say. So with that, Aaron, go ahead and uh, just give us an idea of, of what you have going on specifically with your breeding program, what you're breeding and, and what maybe you have accomplished. Well, when we first started raising chickens, we had to pick a breed and we went, I went to the Livestock Conservancy website and looked up under their heritage poultry and we chose Delawares. And I feel like I picked the perfect breed for me. I love our birds. Um, We've been breeding, selectively breeding them for seven years. So every year we hatch over a hundred chicks just for us. It's always our first hatch of the season. Um, after that, I can take orders, but I always do the first chest for myself. Um, we toe punch them. We zip tie a leg so that I know who their father was, what pen they, breeding pen they came from. And then uh, we start weighing at six weeks old, which most people don't do this, but our Delawares are a dual purpose. Every heritage breed is a dual purpose, but we, the Delawares are more of a meat bird. And so I felt that it was very important for us to get up to the standard, American standard of perfection, which is Delaware's males are butchered at 12 to 13 weeks. 
when we first got our first uh, cockerels the first year were being butchered at 16 and 17 weeks. So I felt that weight was very important, especially if I wanted to be selling chicks to people who were gonna grow them out and sell them for market. So we weigh every two weeks from six weeks on through to butcher weight. And then we weigh the pullets out until um, 20 weeks old. And we've been tracking that for the last six years and have made great improvements on that. Um, so we've been um, very happy with what we've been doing by selecting, tracking everything, selecting, um, mixing, putting breeding pens together that have made a big improvement on our our line of Delaware since night since 2019 since um, 2014 so yeah selecting is really important we could that's a whole nother topic or we could spend a lot of time talking about selecting but um <laughs> yeah and we'll and we'll get there you know, we'll get so to all those details on where you want to go <laughs> yep um so so uh because we're we're focused here in our, in our conversations, you know, uh, the context is heritage poultry, but our details really are around the breeding portion of it. And that's where we're, we're going to try to, to, to build out our mm -hmm. content here. So give us a definition. What does it mean to be a, a heritage poultry breeder and kind of what is, you know, just what, well, what defines it? <laughs> broadly. You um, know? Heritage. Um, yeah, broadly. So, um, Heritage birds, by definition from the Livestock Conservancy, need to be bred to the APA standard, so the standard of perfection. So um, if you get a standard of perfection book from the American, Pastor, not American, American Poultry Association, you can look up a heritage bird and it will give you the weight, the comb, uh, the feathering, all different things. And so we're always breeding to get it to look like the perfect bird that's in that book. Um, they must be able to naturally mate. So um, like a Cornish cross is not going to be able to, I assume I'm not familiar with Cornish cross that much, but they're not able to mate and, and lay eggs. So a heritage poultry is something that can naturally mate. Um, they have to have long productive outdoor lives. So we're looking at what our grandparents, our great grandparents raised. They were um, a farm bird. They lived outside all day long. Um, they lived a long life and we're still laying eggs at seven years and so um, and they have to be slow growth so we're not looking uh, heritage means that they're not being butchered at at six weeks or or 12 even 12 weeks is pushing it but delaware's were um, a cross that was meant to be butchered at 12 to 14 weeks um, so those are the things that livestock conservancy is giving addition of what uh, makes a, a chicken a heritage breed Okay, uh, and thank you. And, and just for the record, uh, you know, the Cornish Cross, um, I believe they, those parent stocks can made it. But I happen to know a really um, old school turkey artificial inseminator from way back. Um, the broad breasted whites can't, can't, and artificially uh, can't breed. But right. so appreciate that. And then so rolling right along, then um, what qualities should a beat, yeah, a beater, what, what qualities should a breeder possess? in order to be successful, quote unquote, whatever that success is. I would say you have to be, um, have attention to detail. Um, you have to um, be willing to research your breed. You want a breed that's going to fit where you live and what your uh, climate is for. Um, the other thing is you want to be detailed. Well, I said detailed, but you want to keep really good records. Because if you're breeding and then selecting, you have to keep track of who's the mother, who's the father, so that you can continue your line and always improve for the best. If you just take, if you've hatched 100 chicks and usually it's 50-50, so if you see pullets and you just split them up into three or four pens and then you just stick whatever rooster you want, you're not going to be improving the breed. You're only just going to be producing chicks. So you're always looking for the best male and the best females to make breeding pens with um, otherwise you won't be successful so you have to track whatever is egg laying that's important to you if it's feather color if it's weight for a meat bird um, all those things pertain to what you're selecting for but you have to you have to look at your birds constantly you can't be you know just 
putting in feed and changing their water and stuff and expect to have a good breeding program and for your breed to improve, which everybody's always working towards improving their breed. Yes, ideally that is the goal, right? Breed improvement um, to improve your line in mm -hmm. some way, right? Right. <clears throat> okay, thank you for that. Um, so now in terms of the, mm -hmm. of, of the heritage birds themselves, what advantages do we have? You, can you, you got uh, two or three kind of advantages of, of heritage poultry for the people who haven't considered it, right? Think, or maybe have considered it and not necessarily made it work, but what, what is enticing about breeding our chickens and turkeys and, and why should we pursue it? Um, the biggest thing I think for me for being a heritage breeze is that they're sustainable. As long as you um, are, have a rooster and hens you're, you, and you let them, uh, they're mating and they're laying eggs and you're hatching chicks, you're sustainable. You don't have to keep going back to the feed store or to um, a hatchery and buying new stock. You always, you can keep adding more, more chicks to your flock and so you're sustainable. You're not having to buy, you know, pay that money to replace them. Um, the other thing is, is that heritage birds are all due purpose, meaning they all are for meat and eggs. Most breeds lean one way or the other, but if you are raising any type of heritage bird, you're going to be able to provide yourself with meat and with eggs. And so that's a big thing, especially for small farms. But if um, a large uh, a large farm wants to be raising a thousand or, or two thousand um, Delawares or um, barred rocks or whatever, they're still going to have that. I can still sell the meat, and I can still sell eggs. And so there's that dual purpose that that the heritage breeds provide. <clears throat> okay. Um, yeah, thank you. I, I think, um, for, you know, one of the things that I always I resonate with a lot of those things, you know, the, the idea of dual purpose birds is really, really appealing. Cause when you look at the hybrid market, which you know, a lot of the pasture poultry is, uh, the community raises hybrids, you know, you, you specialize, you're an egg layer or you're, um, you're, a, a meat type bird and it's that specialization. And it's kind of right. just mimics most everything else we do in our life, but there's something to be said for that general purpose, mm -hmm. kind of, you know, mm -hmm. good at a couple different things. Mm -hmm. um, well, even as an example, um, of course, with COVID, um, I'm assuming just like myself, a lot of people are selling, getting orders for chicks or, or uh, everybody wants to have a bark backyard flock, but now the calls are coming in and saying, oh, I went to the feed store and I got 10 chicks and three are roosters. Will you take them from me? And there's that sustainability. They just want hens for eggs. They don't want roosters. They don't want to butcher them for meat. And so now there's a huge problem with, I'm sure these roosters are being just put out into the wild or dumped somewhere. Mm, and right. you know that's not the way it's supposed to be. Yeah, there's a whole... Um there's a whole concerted effort to try to train those new, new chicken keepers that have come in, come online in the last four or five months. But uh, that's a different topic for another decade. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, so, <laughs> yeah. so here's a, here's the, the big question that a lot of people ask. I, I get this question a lot is, is it worth switching to heritage chickens or, or can they be incorporated into an existing uh, pasture poultry model? that's not focused on, on, on heritage. Like in your estimation, I mean, you, I, I can assume you'll say yes, but I, give us some I of I don't see, yeah. <clears throat> so, so what's the word? Yes, I, I agree. I, I think they clarify. can. Um, <laughs> if you're looking, um, if you already have a market for your, for your birds, um, for your, um, big flocks, your Cornish cross, your freedom rangers, then, um, there's probably a niche market, which is something you and I might have talked about before, is that there's a niche market for a different flavor of chicken. Heritage birds are going to be older when they're butchered, so they have um, a different texture, but they have more flavor. Um, people always say, oh, they taste like what you're when your grandma made, um, you know, fried chicken or Sunday dinner. It, I remember chicken did have more flavor, and so um, there's that, and... Um, and then if you if you want eggs um, of a different 
color. You know, there's there's more possibilities. I know a lot of people that have braised different types of heritage breeds, so they get the beautiful colored box of all the different colored eggs. And um, that could be a market for you that um, a lot of people will pay more for certain colored eggs, especially the Americanas. But um, mm. there's places, I believe, for heritage everywhere that somebody can put them in and, and there'll be a lot of options that they can find for using these birds. Yeah, I appreciate that. And uh, so that brings me to the question that I have um, kind of one of the big things I, I think, I think about the most when it comes to the heritage poultry segment of pasture poultry and kind of what our, what our future is as an association and, and focusing on, on heritage. And, and that is, what are the, some creative ways uh, that you've either done or have seen other people do that growers and breeders can work together? Because we all, I think we can agree that not all breeders make good growers and not all growers make good breeders. It's kind of the rare bird that does both well. Um, so, so mm -hmm. building on that relationship agree, idea, yeah. what do you, um, what, what do you see? We, we, yeah, our focus has always been on breeding. Um, I'm not interested in growing them out and trying to find markets for that. I would rather keep improving my breed and find people who want to grow them out. Um, that's my interest and my goal. And so we were working with um, a, a person that was growing out our birds. They would order maybe 600 a year and then grow them out. And she happened to have a poultry farm that lived was across the street from her. So she was raising out Delaware's, um, New Hampshire's uh, heritage turkeys and heritage uh, swine. And she would have some of her chickens, her chicks go over to her neighbor across the street. So he'd be raising them. So she didn't, she didn't have room for all of them. And then she would take back the males and she would give him her females. So she was in the meat market. So she would, she happens to sell her birds in San Francisco. So she gets a really great price. And so it worked out for both of them. He didn't have to keep buying chicks to, and then have, what do I do with these roosters? Since they were able to work out this, this agreement that worked for both of them. One could focus on meat and one could focus on eggs. And just by buying, because you're going to get usually 50, 50 um, on male or female in a, in a batch. So it worked out for both of them that that's the way they could both be successful um, and still use heritage birds. I'm just curious, Aaron. Do you have any uh, any thought on what, how many birds were were, were in that arrangement? Um, no, I'm not. I just remember her talking about that and what they were doing. I thought it was a great idea um, yeah. because if you just want meat birds, then what do you do with all these hens? So usually we're selling extra pullets because I don't need you know an, every 75 new pullets every year, and so what do I do with them? So I don't, I sell the ones I don't want to the backyarders. Um, and then I keep the ones I'm selecting for breeding that I'm only going to keep anyway. If we have any extras that I'm not going to breed with, we put in our, in our egg laying, um, pen, breeding, uh, not breeding pen, but pen. And then they just get, we don't use them for anything. There's no rooster in there or anything. So, um, yeah. and just to clarify so that's there, how we've worked out having extra pullets. Yeah. And, and just to clarify there, Aaron, like just because you don't breed with that, with that pool, it doesn't mean that she's not a good egg layer, right? You may be selecting based on something entirely different oh, no, other yeah. than egg laying, right? Correct. Yeah. I'm looking that, for body shape and I'm looking for um, weight. And so that's what I'm selecting for, for breeding. And I won't know till she's a little bit older, how good of an egg layer she is. Um, so now we're tracking our breeding pen for both weight and egg laying because I want to be a dual purpose. And so, you know, record keeping helps us know that. Yeah, gotcha. And I like that model too. I think um, as we as we forge some some better um, communication and and relationships here between the breeders and the growers, you know, I think there's opportunity for growers with established markets to to take on some of that that you know heritage mm -hmm. birds, some of that stuff that you don't want to deal with when you when you select your breeders and you have all these mm -hmm. extras like be nice to have a place to put those birds um and somebody who could actually sell right. them and exactly. sell them for the and have a, 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 a even a small but dedicated mm -hmm. audience out of their broader customer base that would, would enjoy it so that's um mm -hmm. that's the future folks that's what i would kind of like to, to see develop and and 
I think it's possible. It just takes a little bit of time. Yeah. Uh, one more, one more question, I guess, Aaron, and um, we went through these pretty quickly, but we, and I did a little bit long on the intro. So we got one more question and then we'll take questions from the audience. Um, so, so go ahead and, and get your questions. I see there's a couple in there already, but then uh, we'll, we'll take them here. What uh, are your thoughts on building capacity within the heritage poultry supply? And the context here, my question is, you know, say an easy example, say somebody wants to, to have an egg laying flock of 500 black ostrilorps, you know, which means now they need a thousand uh, hatched chicks to get that flock roughly. And there's not a lot of breeders who are going to be able to supply that volume all at one time. So right. um, I think there, right. you know, if we don't want to go too fast. There's a, there's a demand and that pulls along the supply, but, but what are your thoughts? Do you have any on building capacity within, within that supply chain? I, we've, we've had that people approach us about that before. And so um, it, I think pre-orders is somebody you know, tells me, well, next year I want to buy 600 chicks from you. We can build up our breeding flock to be bigger. We can have more breeding pens. So looking ahead, that can help the breeder a lot because you only can get so many eggs in 10 days. And depending on what size or how many incubators you have, how many chicks you can hatch. So if somebody tells me I want 300 chicks, you know, in January, then I have to back out and look, okay, what do I need to up my breeding flock? Um, that you have to back out the numbers, just like Matt, Matt had talked about before with, um, with breeding pens, how many do you have to go back to? Um, the other thing is that some heritage breeds can be sexed at hatch. Um, Delaware's cannot. So if somebody just wants, um, you know, 200, males of ostrilorps i'm not sure if those can be sex i'm not sure but then they could just ship those but then they need to find somebody who just wants you know, wants just 200 males and who wants 200 females and so that would depend on the breed on if they could do that but if you're looking at chicks like delawares that aren't ha aren't sexed it takes a lot more numbers and then you're looking at somebody who's willing to have both pullets and cockerels unless they're willing to trade like we talked about a few minutes earlier with somebody who's who's only wants egg layers and somebody who only wants meat birds yeah so what i'm hearing you saying really is there's um there's a focus on on, on understanding what you're dealing with and i think one of the biggest challenges a lot of folks have at least from my perspective is they they treat their heritage birds like the non-heritage birds. And I think really it helps sometimes to think of them as separate, separate product types. Um, you know, cause they are, they're, they're very different in, in customer and approach and mm -hmm. how you have to, to deal with them. So I think some of it's understanding, mm -hmm. right? If mm -hmm. I summarize what you're saying, it's understanding of what you have and then working mm -hmm. with that, that confines, if you really want the, that option then kind of just. You know, yeah. Open. Yeah. If somebody called me and said they wanted birds in a month, and they wanted 300, There's, it's just not possible. I would need more lead time. Another thing um, that we, when we were working with SBN before was that if somebody wanted 500 ostrilorps, they're more, instead of going to just one breeder, maybe you'd reach out to three breeders. And so each, you know, does a portion and sets the same date for shipping. And so they all arrive on the same date, but you're able to get the number that you want, just not from one breeder, maybe from multiple breeders yeah i got you um appreciate that aaron um so i just you can see i brought in some of our i brought in matt um as i get some things set up here matt do you have anything to to add to that what's um uh, you know i know she covered we covered a lot of ground but do you have any any thoughts before we jump into some questions here i did want to uh <clears throat> maybe mention uh, what I've been doing, working with some growers. I have three different growers that actually grow out uh, birds for me. And it's an opportunity for the growers to get uh, the uh, free chicks, essentially, 
and uh, it's an opportunity for me as a as a breeder to get my numbers up and provide uh, get more. You know, obviously when you're when you're when you're breeding for improvement, having a large number of, of chicks hatched uh, allows you to uh, select uh, the best birds. And uh, rather than me have to have growing facilities for, for 500 chicks, I can uh, farm out groups of 100 chicks to growers. Uh, they grow the birds out. I go back at 16 weeks and pick breeders out of, out of that flock. Um, they get to keep the rest of the birds. So they end up with uh, a group of a hundred dual purpose birds uh, at, a, at a significant discount. And it's, it allows me to expand my breeding operation. So it's a, it's a win-win situation for the breeder and the grower. So I'm question, I'm, I'm curious, Matt, then in that scenario, do you provide grow out standards or any kind of operational uh, checks for the, for the growers or do you just allow them to do what they do? Yeah, the answer to the question is yes. Um, we did. We have a we have a review about uh, what my expectations are in terms of uh, husbandry, in terms of how much space they're going to have, and what the what the grow out should look like. And we also have a discussion about nutrition. Um, they've got to meet a, a nutrition standard, or their birds are, are not going to be able to compete with with what I'm growing, or or be be viable. So. And it's it's not been perfect. It's kind of a it's kind of a work in progress with with these guys. Um, and so I've had folks you know stumble the, right out of the gate. But if you work with them and give them feedback and talk to them, at the same time, two years ago I switched uh, feed and ran into a feed dispensing uh, issue on my farm. And some of the birds that my uh, growers were growing out were were better. Uh, representatives of the of the breed than the ones I grew because I had a I had a flaw in my system, and so they provided some insurance and got me good breeder stock in a year where I had a little bit of a problem on my farm. Gotcha. <clears throat> yeah, I appreciate that. And I like that model as well. Um, I think there's some real opportunity to to for breeders to team up with with growers to to do that. I think when I first heard of that, that these are the things that rattle around in my brain when I'm driving down the road kind of thinking about stuff i'm like you, know, you just need which is it's always easy to say you should get people to work together it's actually very very hard to get people to work together um <laughs> but uh, so I, first of all um great great um half hour here of our of our call we're going to transition now and we're going to take questions so